Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Lorna, and I'm an alcoholic. And you can already tell I'm a bit of a diva. But um, I was rather insulted, actually, when Lynn said she's just an alcoholic like you and me. No, I'm not. Um, So, uh, you know, I, I heard this thing at a meeting just recently, actually. And maybe you've heard it, this woman took her son to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he was rather intrigued, and afterwards he said, Ma, he said, when I grow up, I want to be an alcoholic, and she she said, son, you can't do both. It took a little while for me to get it too, but I just think it's, uh, I think it's really right on, uh, and uh, I'm still g- growing up. But I, I've been, this is a great, a very important moment in my life. You know, Jesus, I know you can mention Jesus in an AA meeting and clear the room, but uh, <laughs> At the at the Last Supper, he said, I've longed to eat this meal with you. And that's the way I feel. I've longed to be in Kentucky with you. This is a real moment in my life. And I'm here with my dear friend Peggy Jo, who uh, I met centuries ago here. And she was the one that got me to speak at a meeting which was taped. And that was fatal. After my, it was taped, then it went on, and I've become on this, what they call the circuit ever since. And I'm going to speak once more, and then I'm coming off the circuit. Uh, I think the world has heard enough of me. So, uh, they will have to just muddle through without me. So I, but also this is a very important uh, crossroad time in my life. I, um, in a few days' time, uh, um, on the 11th of this month, I will have been given and granted 39 years of sobriety. uh, And... The only problem with being uh, a long-term sobriety is that one becomes long-term. And the day after that, I turn 70. I don't know how it happened, but there, it's, it's, uh, that's the way it is. And since I'm giving out statistics, I might as well tell you I weigh 158 pounds. I'm, I'm five foot eight. I um, I have no money. I c- <laughs> I can't cook, but uh, I'm good looking. I have pretty ankles, and um, and I'm single. So. So this is a very important, and I, I, it was so wonderful that I was asked to speak at this particular time in my life, in this auspicious birthday and entering my 40th uh, year of sobriety, and I want to thank the committee for choosing me. I know you have a choice of many speakers, and since I've been here, people have been so kind. Lynn and Kathy met me at the airport. We had a great time, and they were very hospitable. Often I met at airports, and they say, oh, well, come out and we'll pick you up. We'll drive by and pick you up like, like I'm the luggage or something. <laughs> and the, uh, but you know they're AAs. Uh, the, um, but 
Lynn and Kathy had a little class, and they walked into the airport and greeted me as I came up the elevator, at uh, the escalator. And then we went to this lovely lunch, and usually at, at conferences, and, and Jim has bent over backwards to be uh, very accommodating to me. And Joe here? No, Josh here. My new best friend, Josh, uh, <laughs> has been helping me with my books outside, and, and I'm very grateful for that. And um, uh, wait a minute, I'm John, I'm going to get to you, but there's something else I have to say. I have a bit of brain damage, I can't quite remember. Um, but anyway, usually when I come to these things, I only ever see the, an airport. The, t uh, the hotel, and again, the airport. And this time, uh, Jim arranged with John C. here to take me on a tour of Cincinnati. And I had no idea about Cincinnati. I had no idea of the history and the beautiful architecture and the old homes. And he took me to see that gorgeous bridge. And we went to Union Station, which I wanted to see very badly. And I, I, I was stunned. And I, I'm just so impressed that I'm really in the area where AA was born, in the general vicinity of... Um, so I, it's, it, it's very meaningful for me. I don't want you to think that I'm just, you know, here speaking. I, I, I want to mark it, that it's really uh, it's something for me to be in Kentucky. And a lot of things have happened to me here. And I'll relate the story of how I almost picked up at 32 years here in Kentucky. And uh, so <laughs> I know you can't... <laughs> You can't wait to hear that, but I also want to tell you that there's a spare seat here on which I was sitting in the front row, if you want to sit down, ladies, in the back there. And there's a seat right here in the front row. There's several seats, so you don't have to be standing if you don't want to. Um, so uh, I uh, have I thanked enough? I, have I done enough thanking? Yes. All right, that's enough. So... Um, <laughs> They asked, I've been asked, I've had several requests. I feel like a piano player, you know, with several requests. And one of the requests I was asked to reiterate is about the manus, the original manuscript of the big book. The original manuscript of the big book in two, a few years ago, 2004, something like that, anyway, it came up for auction at Sotheby's in New York. And, it, how it, what it had happened was Lois had given it to a man who had helped her very much after Wilson died. He moved into the house on the property and he helped her with a lot of paperwork and that. And as a gift, she gave him the original manuscript with all uh, Bill's notes on it. And consequently, life, the pages of the calendar turned, she died, and eventually he got very sick and he needed money. So he had this piece of property and he knew it was valuable. So he took it to Sotheby's and they recognized it as an, as a, an important American document. And it was entered in a very important sale of, uh, manuscripts. And it came up for auction. Now, the auctioneer was not the same person who had, was the expert of it. The auctioneer was completely different. So it was, but it was beautifully rendered in the catalog. Several pages were given to it. There was a lot of history about it, a lot of history about Bill W. So it was really given the, a great platform. It was, the estimate on it, I think, was two to three hundred thousand. And the, uh, you know, that day of the auction, the room was packed with AAs. Just packed. And the auctioneer was there, and the bidding went up and up and up. And the gavel came down at $1.5 million. And the, the AAs were like, oh, the big book, the big book, and they're hugging and they're kissing and oh my god, the big book. And I, I'm an auctioneer, so I'm interested in the process. And I saw the auctioneer turn to the record keeper, and I saw him ask her, did this guy write anything else? <laughs> and we, as 
as a, a society and a fellowship, we have some very important things that uh, 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 America. I mean, there's Levi's and there's Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, it's really <laughs> up there. And uh, one of the things that's madly important, it's a great prayer of mine, is our preamble. It is very, it's a very powerful holy s statement and should never be treated lightly. It's absolutely fantastic. I think it should be up there with, I have a dream speech, the American Constitution, the Gettysburg Address. It's an incredible piece. It tells us what we are, what we're not, who we belong to, where our allegiances lie, what our primary purpose is. And I remember being in London once, and um, the, there was a visitor there from America, and he was asked to read the preamble. And the English person that was chairing the meeting said, it is so wonderful to hear the preamble read in its original tongue. <laughs> So, you know, just as a, a little background of that. So I guess you're wondering if I have a story and if I'm never going to tell it. Uh, maybe. Uh, uh, I could talk about 19th century paintings or something. But anyway, my, this is my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, my husband had finally walked out the door, and, and I thought it was the most interesting thing he'd ever done. It really... <laughs> it really caught my attention, but I... I was devastated, devastated, heartbroken, really heartbroken. And I wanted so much to get him back. I mean, I was having an affair with someone else, but you know how it is. It's, it's, it gets a little mucky in the end. Uh, it gets a little confusing. So uh, I happened to be in a sauna one night with a girlfriend of mine, and she, and I'm here I am, oh, the husband's wife, and she said, Lorna, I went to this meeting last night of Alanon. She said, and all the women sounded just like you. And as soon as she started talking about alcohol, I knew without a shadow of a doubt my husband was an alcoholic. And... <laughs> I wanted to get right on it. So I, the very next night, I went to a meeting of Al-Anon. And it was suggested there that one go to open AA meetings. I thought, right. I mean, I'm not going to muck around. This is all about him. I want to get him back. So, so I could torture him some more, I think. <laughs> so... So the following, I, I called the central office of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous in New York, and that very night, there was a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous right up the road from where I worked. And it was a meeting, an open meeting, where people like myself, who were not alcoholics, could attend. So that that after work that evening I went across the road I worked at Sotheby's myself and I um, I was the first woman art woman I was the first I was the first woman art auctioneer in America so I had this very highfalutin public job right out there falling apart right out there uh, on the front page of the New York Times right out there in a dress that was, I cringe every time I see that picture. You know, it's not sort of, for me, it's not, I don't cringe to what I did. I cringe, oh, God, what I wore. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that night, I, I went right opposite Sotheby's uh, was uh, the Carlisle Hotel. And in the Carlisle Hotel was Bemelman's Bar. And I would go with my friends uh, across the road and to Bemelman's Bar after work. And I love to drink on an empty stomach. I, I, I fasted all day long. I, I, 
I, I didn't know it was fasting. I called it, I'm awfully busy. <laughs> but I didn't eat, and I'd go across on that first vodka and orange juice hitting the stomach. Whoa! I didn't want to talk to the bartender. I didn't want to eat the peanuts. I didn't want to, I wanted that drink. And I didn't, I could never have identified it as that. I could never identify that I had a craving to drink. I had no idea that I had a problem with drink. It took me two years in here to understand I had alcoholism. I'll tell you all about that. So I, um, I went across the road to my, with my friends and we're drinking and I said, no, it's almost 7.30. I'm going to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll be back. So, so I toddled up the road to this meeting that I had checked out, and I walked in, and... I'm looking all around, wondering if there are any alcoholics here. I wonder if there are any. I thought they were going to be like something out of Ben-Hur, the lepers, you know, all <laughs> covered in rags and things, and they were going to be cringing on the side of the rooms and <laughs> defeated and smelly and... Uh, and there were these bright people, and it was on the Upper East Side of New York, and it was at the, the silk stocking meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, the Blue Blood, the Park Avenue, of course, where I belonged. And um, <laughs> so I, I walk in, and I sit down, and this there, there was a three-speaker meeting, and this first guy got up on the stage, and he stood behind a podium, much like that, and in front of the podium, leaning up against it, was um, a, a, a sign in our, you know, gothic language that AA uses, and it said, but for the grace of God, dot, dot, dot. And I suppose that we were to see that chap standing up there, and realize that but for the grace of God, we could be that poor wretch. Um, so, anyway, he said this. This is what he said. He said, my name's Don, and I'm an alcoholic. <gasps> now, I think you can hear that I have a slight accent. I'm British, and actually I'm an American now but I don't chew gum. Um, the, the, and I remember thinking, I was like horrified, like, good God, we don't all want to know. Isn't <laughs> Surely there's some things you keep to yourself, really. It's a bit, a bit much. But I was intrigued by Don's story absolutely fascinated and I was rolling about laughing, I felt moved when he had upsets in his life, I was joyful for his successes and his accomplishments and I was with him in his loves and his disturbances and his job and I was with Don all the way I had no idea it was called identification and I was riveted and after Don got down, two other fellows got up and told equally as interesting stories. And I think that that, that alone, qualifies me to be in these rooms. I think if one comes to these meetings and one listens to people ruining their lives, marrying women when they're 14 years old and taking on children... Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, volunteering to ride horses when one hasn't an idea of the front or the back of a horse, the, all the other stuff that we standing in front of judges where you use the judge's first name, you're on the, the judges, and and we talk, and you listen to stories about how people threw up on clients, they lost their jobs, their family, their children don't talk to them and they're crawling on the bathroom floor, and you find it interesting. <laughs> There's something the matter with you. <laughs> 
Well, it's 38, almost 39 years uh, later, and I still find it fascinating. <laughs> I mean, you come to these rooms, you hear stories. Uh, I mean, it blo really, it blows your mind <laughs> what, what people have survived, and uh, that they're still here, and that they've been forgiven and restored, and all sorts of things happen to them. And I'm still intrigued. I'm still loving it. It's 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 endlessly interesting to me, and that's what's interesting in AA that we tell each other stories. That if you have a group where you just go around and talk about your stuff, that's fine, but it's imperative that we listen to stories. It's imperative that we do not lose that in AA. That we don't just have meetings where, well, what would you like to talk about today? Or someone says, well, you've all heard my story. I want to say, as though we remember. I mean... <laughs> So that was my entree into AA. I uh, went back to the bar, and I said to my friends, I, I, what did I know about anonymity? I didn't understand anonymity. I didn't understand the sacredness of anonymous. I thought it was a good job. You were anonymous. You should be anonymous. You, you, you should keep it down. Um, <laughs> And I told my friends every detail about the meeting, and I said things like, well, you'd never guess who is an alcoholic. <laughs> so, I've often had this vision of God and angels sort of flopping on the clouds, trying to steer me in here, trying to, like, this way and this way and this way. But heaven holds its breath, and it, heaven is never pushy, and heaven waits for us to respond. And we're often given lots of opportunities. And that was the beginning of my entree into an awareness of Alcoholics Anonymous. And... I'm really, I'm going to skip over so much because there's so much has happened to me in sobriety. But several, I was like a plane coming into land without my landing gear down. I belly flopped along the runway for a long time and my undercarriage was all scraped and the wings were torn off and the passengers were strewn around and there were bras and panties on the bushes and, you know, I... I just was, it was just, I have a very female story, it was just a mess. <laughs> there was the husband and the lover and the this and the that and the, oh, it was just, I, and I, when I finally came in, you know, I, I, I didn't know how you knew I was new. When I, I walked in the doors and I, I, when I finally decided, oh God, I'm here for myself, I, this is for me, I, I, I thought, but I add, when I walked in, I thought I added great tone and class to AA. <laughs> but you took one look at me and you said, well, thank God Lorna has arrived. <laughs> now we can hold our heads up high. We, we don't have to be quite so anonymous and, and so humble. We can walk out of, into the sunlight of notoriety because she will lead the way. Meanwhile, you were patting me on the back, and you were saying, you keep coming back, sweetheart. You're in the right place. <laughs> and I had no idea how you knew that I was one of you. I had no idea that I was one of you. I really, I didn't come into AA. I was truly brought in here, and I was absolutely... <laughs> When I think about it, millions of dollars went under my gavel. I was very smart, very clever. In my mind was sharp and there and this in my job. And I was totally delusional about my life. Delusional. The, I, one of the ways you could tell that I was new was I was, I wore gobs of makeup. 
And I didn't take it off at night. I was like Elizabeth I. I just slathered more on every day. <laughs> because I couldn't be bothered. It was just too much to take it all off. And I was festooned in jewelry. I had jewelry all over the place in places where... Mm, and I... Long before it was fashionable. And... And I am just immensely grateful, immensely grateful that I came into Alcoholics Anonymous truly on my belly grateful that I came in before the craze of tattooing and piercing came about because I would not have been satisfied with a little rosebud on my butt. I, I would have wanted the entire crucifixion scene on my chest. Uh, with weeping virgins and <laughs> bleeding piercings on the cross, you know, and all the, all the, oh, I, I, and not for me, a little ring in my nose or my lip here. I would have wanted a plate in my lower lip. <laughs> I, I'd want you to be able to see it. I, I, I didn't want anything discreet. I wasn't discreet, you know. I. I didn't drop acid because I wanted an ordinary day, and I... <laughs> and I'm not an ordinary sort of person. God has put that app within me that I have a longing for the extreme. So given a tattoo, oh, I can't believe what I would have had done. So I'm very grateful that I don't have a tattoo or I, I did have four piercings in one ear. That's what I did. <laughs> so, uh, and here I am at this very highfalutin job. But anyway, the... So here I am, and I've walked into AA, and you're very kind, and I, I, I was just a bit of a real mess, I, you know, and it took me ages, really ages, to see that I had a problem. I thought I'd nipped it in the bud. I thought I'd gotten in here before it got bad. I could see that I had tendencies towards alcoholism, but I didn't really have it. And wasn't I clever that I'd come in before it developed into a problem? <laughs> Meanwhile, you were like, oh, that one, she has a problem. <sighs> And it wasn't manifested in my drunkenness or my... It was manifested in my thinking and in my behavior and in my delusional attitude about life and about who I was. I can, when I was about... Oh, I, I had plenty of money because I was working regularly. And at the end of my drinking, I was dressing out of thrift shops. I, I couldn't be bothered to go, I, I was terrified to go into a department store and go through a rack of clothes and choose a, a, something that I liked. I went into a thrift shop, if it fit me, I bought it. And sometimes it had cigarette stains on it or cigarette holes, other people's cigarette holes on it. <laughs> and um, I, I was... One time, and someone else asked me to tell this story. Uh, one time at work, I'm a, you know, it, just because one puts down the drink doesn't mean to say that one's sober. It, the, the, the blades of the fan keep spinning even after the power is turned off. <laughs> and one day a co-worker came to me and in a very lovely, calm voice, the sort of voice one uses to one you don't want to disturb too much, she asked me, Lorna, why are you wearing a maid's uniform? <laughs> and I took a look at this dress I had on, and I realized, oh my God, I'm wearing a maid's uniform. It had the little collar, and the 
uh, buttons down the front or a zip it might have had, the little fabric matching belt and the cuffs here. And uh, it was that ghastly salmon color. And I had bought it because it made me look neat and tidy. <laughs> And I was desperate to keep it, trying to keep it together. And it's amazing when I went to see people's collections or they came into the auction house and they asked for the expert and I showed up. It's amazing they didn't give me their coat to hang up. It's, the, the, to think that I was the expert, they must have been dumbfounded. The, the only thing that saved me, I think, was this accent, really. <laughs> However, trying to keep it in pages of the calendar turn, I do get sober. I do put together time. And I don't think you, we, can t we can say to someone, I think it's very silly, actually, to say to someone that's drinking, you know, if you don't drink, you can be sober. What's sober? What is that? What does that mean to someone that's drinking? There's no concept of it. It's like talking about marriage at the altar. Marriage is something that takes years of involvement. It's something that happens. Sobriety is something we understand after we're in it and we've got experience of it. I think it's best to say, that I say to newcomers, you know, if you, if you stay with us, you can be like stepping over into a whole new dimension and you'll look much better and <laughs> you might lose some weight and uh, I talked to them about things of, of day to day life not nothing about sober and you'll have a spiritual experience I don't want a spiritual experience I just I don't know but everyone's different and I'd, I've never enticed anyone in the program with the offer of sobriety Never. But um, I've enticed them by my uh, lifestyle. So, and talking about, um, there was something I was going to talk about, about that, I forget, something very wonderful I was going to say. <laughs> I forget about, anyway, so let me just press on. The, so, life happens to me. I have a, a sponsor. And I always try and say this. She knew I was out to lunch. She knew I couldn't grasp the fact that I drank. That I, I, uh, that drinking was a problem. It was like, all right, if they don't want me to drink, I won't drink. I don't carry on about it. All right. Make up your mind. Don't drink. All right. That's it. You don't have to go through all these steps and all this rigmarole and all this. And I, she said to me, Lorna, if you stay with us and you do what we suggest, you will be able to have a life that's like, you will be able to develop a life that's like having a quiver of golden arrows on your back. And when you come into a situation in life that you're not too sure how to handle, you'll be able to reach back, select the perfect arrow, put it in your bow, and thwang! hit bullseye every time. And that, ladies and gentlemen, fellow alcoholics, was what captured me. The idea of hitting bullseye, the idea of being appropriate in the world. I was totally inappropriate. And I used loser phrases. Hear up. Don't ever use this phrase. Well, that's just the way I am. Or that's the way I always do things. Or we always do it this way. Or we always do it that way. Or Jim always sits in that seat. Or that's Mary's particular place. <gasps> so um, uh, the idea of being appropriate. No one ever said to me anything about my drinking. No one ever said, Lorna, you're drinking too much. Or do you want to look at your drinking? People said things to me like, shh. <laughs> or do you mind or you know 
what you thought was rather amusing was actually kind of spiteful. So I just was, you know how we say we always felt wrong? That we felt wrong. I was a jagged scream in the world, and I felt wrong because we are wrong. We're always doing something to cause other people to cringe and us to cringe and to back away from us. And we get antsy because we think they don't understand. And it's true. That's why we gather together, because we understand each other. Um, anyway, I, I have to race along because I can't go over. I started at 10 past. Uh, so I'll speak for an, an hour. Um, the life goes on and things happen to me that that happened in life you know my, both my parents died and i my relationship with my mother especially was uh, fraught but in the end it was fine it was uh, uh, we had a very nice relationship and my mother died of chronic alcoholism and it wasn't she who had changed we were all right together and then life goes on, life goes on, and I get on a very intense, uh, I, I, I left, oh, well, I guess I should talk about this. I, I went on a very intense spiritual path. I got really captured by the, a, a spiritual possibility and the spiritual life. It really appealed to me. And you know what? I, I think people in AA fall in... This is very general. This is not scientific. This is based on nothing. But you see people falling into these three categories. They come in and they haven't read a book for ages. They can't concentrate. And the next thing, they're therapists. Uh, the... <laughs> alcoholism counselors. They get those that come in, they've been living on Twinkies and coffee and uh, just junk food for ages. They are vegans, they're running marathons, and they're, they're in, involved in all that. And then you get those that, like myself, that come in that are just out to lunch, and they get hooked on the spiritual path. And it's a, it's the most dangerous path to be hooked on because we can think we have. I often think I wish I had the relationship with God that I had when I was two years sober. We were so cozy together. We had such an intimate knowing of each other, and it was God and me and God and. Me. I listened to God, and God listened to me, and we knew, we knew what we were up to. And the, um, <laughs> and now I have no idea. I, I, I just don't know. But anyway, because of this intense spiritual uh, quest, I was very interested in other people that had had an intense spiritual quest. And as I said, you know, you can mention Jesus in an AA meeting and clear the room. But he became my, my. I, I, I just fell in love with the life of Christ, and it was my, it was my thing. He was, to me, he was like the Che Guevara of the spiritual world. I just thought he was something else, and I wanted to be like that. And you know, I wanted the whole crucifixion, but I wanted NBC and ABC to be there at, at the time. I wanted to offer myself for the world. <laughs> Nothing small. This went along with the tattoos. So I you know, wasn't interested in helping the person in front of me. I was interested in being a messiah. So uh, because of that interest, I got interested in other people that had had that same kind of affair. And anyway, one thing led to another. And I got introduced to the work of Mother Teresa. And I went... I, on an impulse, my secretary had given me a book about her, and on an impulse, I had time due me from my work, I booked a round trip ticket to Calcutta, and I went. I just got on the plane, and I went. And I didn't dare tell them I was coming, because I knew Calcutta needed an auctioneer like a hole in the head, so... <laughs> And I knew those nuns, I'd been raised by them, and I knew they were going to say, well, unless you're a nurse, dear, or a doctor, please don't bother. But the money you were going to spend on your fare, why don't you send that to us? I thought, I'm not giving them my money. So I, um, 
I arrived and I pulled the bell on the door of the mother house. I got the address out of the book and the door opened. This woman standing in front of me in the habit of the missionaries of charity and the white sari with the blue edging. And she um, took one. She was about my age. She took one look at me and she's barefoot. And I'm I'm in designer culottes because I'm going to India. (laughs) And I'm in this beautiful little shirt, my feet are beautifully pedicured and my nails manicured red blondes, Cadillac red I had (laughs) and I said to her hello, I said I'm here to help the poor (laughs) (laughs) and she said won't you come in and uh, that woman recognized the poor when she saw her I was the poor And anyway, uh, that visit, I met Mother Teresa, and this is just, I'm really going to skip over such a lot of this. Uh, Mother and I became very close, and I I think we became close because we argued all the time. And I didn't, I had no sort of thing of her, oh, Mother Teresa, I didn't see her in that way. I thought, I'm famous too. Um, uh, (laughs) And uh, I thought, you know, I'm on a spiritual path, and you and I are practically twins. Uh, (laughs) But uh, anyway, I was there for three weeks that first time, and then I, I left, and I said to Mother, God, you know, this has been fascinating. I was there, I was burying the dead and working with lepers and it was a far cry from selling Picassos, let me tell you. So uh, when I left, I said, Mother, I don't, uh, you know, it's been intriguing, but I don't know how you stand it here, really, it's awful. And she said, yeah, yeah, I understand, uh, it, it's, it, it's difficult. And I, she said, you know, I couldn't do it without my daily practice, without my daily ma- uh, mass. So I left and a year to the day, A year to the day, March the 16th, I walked back into that mother house in Calcutta and she looked at me and she said, I knew you'd be back. And we had a very interesting, very interesting uh, friendship. She needed a friend too. And she was, mother was intrigued that I was sober. She was intrigued that I, she was intrigued with the whole idea of that we stand up and we talk about ourselves because she came from a culture and a, um, a, a tradition of you don't talk about yourself. And one of the things that was interesting about mother was she never, ever, ever started a sentence with the word I. It was always how nice to see you or something like that, but not I am happy to see you. It was a, it was a discipline, it was a mental discipline, and it was just very interesting. But, um, she was very, very intrigued with AA, and every time I, I went, I went there every day, I, twice a day, I went there for more, the morning and the afternoon, because I thought I hadn't done anything Catholic for centuries, and I, I, I just thought, well, when in Rome, do what they do, so I went along and I just did what they did. And she, every time I was there, she kind of, wheedled me part and shoved, get me into a room and she wanted to talk about Alcoholics Anonymous and my life. And sometimes I'd say to her, Mother, you're awfully interested. Are you sure you don't have a problem? <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to tell you, one of the reasons Mother was interested, and this is something I want to pass to you, and I want you to remember it. She was interested because Mother had success. Mother Teresa, who the world considers a saint, had success with every form of suffering human, but she could not help the alcoholic because she did not have the words of everlasting life that you and I have. And those words are, I know how you feel, 
let me tell you what happened to me. And she sympathized, she empathized, she was intrigued, but she couldn't do anything. And pride of place in the um, in the chapel in Calcutta, underneath the statue of the Blessed Virgin, where she put a, it stands on a very big sort of mahogany plinth. She put things that were important to her. And pride of place was our little plastic card with the preamble, the I am responsible statement, and the 12 steps and 12 traditions. So, just as I've never said this in, on the tape, but Mother was in New York one time, and I, I was with her, and she went to the Marriott Hotel to pick up an award, I think, from the Knights of Columbus. Anyway, I went with her, and we were in a limousine with outriders, you know, guys on motorbikes like the president has. We were this little old nun and me are sitting in this uh, limousine, and we've got these outriders. And there's other there's other sisters in the car too, and on the way back from this thing, I asked Mother if we could stop so that I could go to the AA meeting on 84th Street between Park and and Madison. And the whole thing came to a stop to let me off. And I knew she was dying for me to ask her to come in. <laughs> and I thought, I am not walking into a meeting without Mother Teresa. Uh, those people are going to think they're having DTs. <laughs> so... Um, there's two more stories I w want to tell before I end that uh, at one time Mother Teresa was extremely ill and we thought it was the time that she was going to die. She was old and it was time. And I dashed off to Calcutta. I wanted to see her. And when I got there, they took me straight away to the hospital. And I walk into this room, and it's a very narrow room. Why they had her squashed in this tiny room, I don't know. But anyway, she, there she is, and she's in bed, and she's propped up against pillows, and she's all in a white um, a tunic, like a, a high night shirt, and uh, the kerchief on her head. And uh, she was stunned to see me, but uh, we greeted each other, and uh, like that. And I'd been there just a few minutes when a young Indian priest came in to offer mass for her, and they set the patient's table, you know, the thing that rolls. They set that up at the foot of the bed as the altar. So he stood at the foot of the bed facing Mother. I'm standing. She's here. I'm standing here, squashed up against her. There's, a, there's another sister here, Sister Monica, and there's two other sisters on the other side of the bed. So he's offering Mass, and it comes time for communion. And he comes around the side of the bed, and I push myself away like this so that he can... Mother pushes herself off the pillows, and it was there was a time in the, the Catholic Church, of, you know, in the late 80s, 90s, where they were dipping the host in the wine. And he holds up this dripping host to mother. She pushes herself forward, put, and he puts it on her tongue. I'm next. And in that, you know, the mind, like a super-duper computer, the mind goes... The Lorna, not here. Don't make a fuss here about the wine. Just, there's this saint dying in bed next to you. Don't bring all the attention onto yourself. <laughs> Don't make it all about you. Just go along with it. There's no one here to see you, no one a in AA is here. And for God's sakes, they would understand. It's, and it's not wine, it's the sacred blood of Jesus, for God's sakes. 
and immediately following on that thought, one of my most poignant thoughts that keeps me, and I reflect on it often, is Bill Wilson standing in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel. And he's standing there wondering what to do. He can see the bar. I've been there. I've visited that. It's amazing. The bar was just right here. And he can see they're jolly and they're having time at the end of their day. And he, he had a, his business had gone south. He was a failure. He was a loser. It was over. And he stood there on the brink of what would he do? Would he go to the bar? He could get out of this god awful day. Or he could go to the phone and try and find another alcoholic that he could talk to. And heaven held its breath. Heaven didn't force Bill Wilson. And in those, and no one, if you and I had been there, we wouldn't have been able to say, see that young guy? In front of me, we are witnessing a monumental moment in the annals of mankind. Because of this decision this man is going to make in the next minute or so, millions of lives will be altered. We would not have recognized it. And, you know, Bill Wilson turned. And it matters what you and I do unseen. It matters how we live. It matters what we choose. It matters where we go, where we, where we are to be found, how we present ourselves to the world, how we dress, how we look, how we are. It matters. We are the stewards of an incredible gift. We are the stewards of a great message. And um, I had that thought, and I put my hand up to him, and I said, no, don't dip the host. He's already holding up this dripping host to me. And I said to Sister Monica, you take it. And she put it, and this guy's a little confused, you know, he's saying mass for this woman's in bed. And I said, I'd like communion, just don't dip it in the house, in the wine. So he gives me communion, and he goes around the other side of the bed. And I'm standing there feeling exactly the way I thought I was going to feel. I'm not feeling holy, I'm not feeling, uh, oh, I did the next right thing. I, I, I'm not feeling any of that. I'm not feeling like, oh, that was good, Lord. I, uh, or I just feel, oh, you've always got to stand out. You've always got to make a fuss. It's all about you. And while he's around the other side of the bed, mother's hand comes across the covers. She takes my hand. She pulls me down to her. And she said, well done. You must continue to protect that precious gift. So... We will all come up against those moments. We will all come up against those moments where we're with business people and the way, and we have to ask yet again, what is this cooked in? Does this have alcohol? And we don't want to stand out in front of our clients. We don't want to look weird. Um, but it matters. Am I willing to claim you? Am I willing? I'm, it's, I'm not having some, adulterous affair with you. It's not something behind closed doors that I'm doing with you, but when I'm out there, I'm pretending I'm not, you know, you're not a part of my life. This is my life. I want to claim you. I don't want God to say, well, I don't know much about you. You know, I want to be claimed. So I must claim you, and I must claim my life in here. And just... Oh, I have five more minutes. <laughs> so I, I have, uh, to wrap this up, I want to tell this story. As I told you, I'm an auctioneer, and I don't do, uh, I don't work for an auction house anymore. I do uh, fundraisers for charities and things like that. But I, I'm, wanted, I'm, anyway, let's look at that. So I, um, 
a few years ago, seven years ago, I've been very ill for the last seven years. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm sitting down, besides to show you my pretty ankles, is um, <laughs> is that I have a defibrillator, and if I stand too long, it fires, and I don't want to be shooting across the room. <laughs> so where you're so whoop, there goes long. <laughs> So, uh, and I feel more intimate actually sitting down. I think it's more intimate than standing behind a podium. So, why am I saying this? <laughs> uh, but, oh, no. Something else. I want to tell two more stories. That's right. Um, after Mother died, I, I, I wrote a book. It, I wrote two books, actually. They're, they're both all about me. They're so interesting. Um, <laughs> but the first book was a lot about my life with her. And uh, to, to fast forward, I got called by the Vatican to be a witness for her beatification. And uh, I, I, I did that. I, I witnessed for her. And, and it doesn't really matter what I think of... The, you know, what I think of that whole rigmarole of, of sainthoods and all that. She would have liked it. And it always seems to be about growth these days. It's no, they, they're always looking for miracles, but the miracles are always about the removal of growths. It's, they should come to the basement of churches and see the, multi, the multitude of miracles. But anyway, I did it. And I did it because it was something Mother would have liked. A mother would have appreciated. And I did it for her. And you know, when I came in the program, you said to me, life can be beyond your wildest dreams. And I could have thought of something far wilder than this, let me tell you. <laughs> but when that happened for me, I realized that you were offering me life beyond my wildest dreams. And you were saying, it's beyond your tacky, wild dreams, Lorna, into a different dimension. And doing that for mother was beyond my wildest dreams. That I'm an auctioneer, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm a witness to a saint, for God's sakes. <laughs> um, so I am my my I'm in the Vatican, in the archives of the Vatican. Really. I mean really. So I you know, I haven't won an Oscar, I haven't won a Pulitzer Prize, but that's my thing. I haven't won a marathon. But um it and I realized that beyond our wildest dreams is always, always without fail about the other. And this morning we heard Tom speak and he got very emotional when he said, my son in the back of the room and his son sober was beyond his wildest dreams. And it was a real demonstration. The things that make us so happy always are inclusive of the other. Always. Without fail. So this last story I want to tell you, you know, seven years ago I had a double mastectomy and um, I, uh, when one has that done, then afterwards I uh, was starting chemo a few months after the healing took place and I was at an AA meeting and a girlfriend walked in and she was showing me this theatrical thing and uh, where they advertise for people, for talent. And she said, look at this one, she's an actress. And it said, Sex and the City, auctioneer, female, 50s to 60s, should be or have been a real auctioneer, British is a plus. <laughs> And after I'd had this operation, I was trying to do things that would make me get up and get out of the house every day. One thing every day. So I had drains coming out from my morgue, something over me. I had drains underneath the surgery. And I went to this audition. 
And of course, I'm the only one there. And, uh, <laughs> and it's in one of these enormous shed-like places where people are twirling and people are practicing their opera and they're doing all sorts of things because they're auditioning for all different types of commercials and they're tapping away. And I go and I read the lines that they've given me and I go back home and I think, well, that, was, that got me out of the house today. And I had absolutely no investment in doing this thing at all. I'm not an actress. And I knew actresses would have given their right arm to do a, a role in Sex and the City. So some months later, I've started chemo. And the phone rings, and it's the casting director. And she said, we'd like to offer you the part. I said, you're joking. And she said, no. She said, when the director saw it, he leapt off his stool and he said, that's the woman I wanted. And he'd seen me do a charity event and he based the part on me. So, uh, and I show up. So I said to her, I said, well, how important is my look? And she said, oh, it's very important. So I said, well, I better come clean. I said, I've just started chemo, and when I have my next chemo in a couple of weeks, all my hair's going to fall out. And she said, oh, we'll get back to you. <laughs> so half an hour later, the phone rang again, and uh, she said, we'd still like to offer you the part. And they altered their entire shooting schedule to get me in before this second round of chemo, because although they could have put a wig on me, I'm sure, the thing is they thought I might feel too ill and I might look too ill. So there I am, they shoot this part. So I just want to say this to the ladies. Here I was, a woman in my 60s, without my breasts, about to go bald, and I'm in a sexy movie. So... <laughs> so don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. <laughs> and don't tell me that anything is impossible unto the Lord. So what is impossible... It's me being here and being with you and the uh, amazing trajectory of my life that I get to celebrate this day with you, this day in August of 2015. And So I thank you. Thank you for going to meetings. Thank you for putting money in the basket and contributing to life. Thank you for doing service. Thank you for being my friends. Thank you for all that you do, because if you weren't here, I'd have absolutely nowhere to go, and I and millions like me would be completely lost. So I have a deep, deep thank you for your sobriety. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.